My name is Father Mark Mary. I'm a Franciscan missionary of the Eternal Word. And it's part of the charism of our community is uh, Eucharistic adoration. Our foundress is Mother Angelica, poor Claire, perpetual adoration. And her community had lived a life, cloistered life dedicated to Eucharistic adoration. Those, the poor Claire's of perpetual adoration, they are a special uh, inspiration for everyone, I think, in their life of adoration to put Jesus at the center of our life. They do it very concretely in Eucharistic adoration. I think lay people, though, might not have the time for that, obviously, as much as a cloistered nun, but the, the same truth is there that they have to, we all have to put Jesus at the center. He's the center of the kingdom. He's the center of our life. And we can live that out in a concrete way in adoration, asking God for strength. I'm here with a statue of St. Anthony in the Franciscan tradition is one of, of great respect and honor, and St. Francis himself spoke beautifully about the Eucharist and its importance in our life, you know, that we are to have great reverence, that this is the most sublime of mysteries. And we learn humility, we learn even poverty uh, from Jesus becoming, coming to us under the form of bread and wine in the Eucharist, dispossessing himself of everything and just being humbly present in our life in such an extraordinary way. We as Catholics can go to Mass, receive Him. We can spend time in adoration after Mass, you know, or during the week, you know, as part of our personal piety and prayer life. And there's so much strength to be gathered from just being in His presence, just sitting in His presence, you know, and just talking to Him, just bringing the inside out in our life and just communicating Him, telling Him, our joys, our sorrows, our hopes, our fears, you know, enjoying that strength from Him. I remember years ago, I had a conversion experience at the end of college, and I went back home, I was working, I was in my parish, and, and a group of us started a young adults group, and I remember I wanted to share this kind of new discovery in my life of adoration, and and it was largely through Bishop Sheen and some of the talks he would give to priests about the importance of the Holy Hour. And I started doing that myself. We, had a, we were blessed to have a, an adoration chapel in my parish. But I remember wanting to share this with my friends. And I remember going to different sources and reading different things. And some of the saints just wrote beautifully and just very clearly and explicitly about the real presence and its importance and everything. But when I found the text in the scriptures of John 6, I thought that was the most powerful teaching, right? Because that's the Word of God. That's going to have a special efficacy for us when we read it, when we reflect on it. And it was a Protestant convert to Catholicism that drew me, drew my attention to this. And if we look at, at John 6, it's just this clear teaching of his real presence. And I, I think the heart of it is in around verse, uh, no, it is verse 653, where, you know, he tells the Jews that were there following him, you know, unless you eat the flesh, the Son of Man drink his blood, you have no life within you. And, and, he, and the people start questioning him, they start murmuring, they're speaking out against him. And he keeps repeating this. And he doesn't say, well, it's just a metaphor or it's just a poetic expression. You know, don't, don't leave, you know, don't leave. He actually makes the, the teaching clearer and stronger and even changes the word. He said, you know, truly, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh, the Son of Man drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him on the last day. And he actually, and you don't see it in the English, but in the Greek he used a different verb for eating, which at the time was used to describe animal eating and munching, gnawing, a very graphic description of, of eating. So what he was saying is, this isn't simply a metaphor what I'm saying. You literally have to do it. We do this through the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist. So it looks like bread and wine, but the inner reality, the substance, has changed into the body and blood of Christ. And what happens if we do it? He, he, he goes on to say, he said, he who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. So the, the Eucharist is the bread of life. It's Christ himself. It fills us with his presence. It draws us uh, more 
deeply into his life, into his mystical body. When I eat other food, I, I transform it into my flesh. When I eat this heavenly bread, this bread from heaven, I am incorporated more deeply into the body of Christ himself, that mystical body that we are, the body of Christ as Paul describes. So that's an effect, <laughs> that I, I'll have this eternal life given to us, I have this very life of God given to us. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, I'll raise him up on the last day. As, as St. Augustine said, how could we not rise from the dead? We're not receiving the dead body and flesh and blood of Christ. It's his resurrection, his resurrected body. It's full of life, it's full, transfused with the Holy Spirit. So it's this, this super abundant food that gives us life. So if I've been receiving that my whole life, how can you keep me in the ground? <laughs> I heard a Protestant pastor even say, when he's talking about the general resurrection, he said, you know, if the worms have eaten you up, they'll spit you out, right? <laughs> because when he comes again in glory, he's gonna raise our body. You know, we have, we're, we're living daily we, at times. You know, we can go to him daily at Mass and receive and have this life within us. And he says, I'll raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, my blood is and drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's what I was talking about, being incorporated into his life, this mutual abiding presence. We're part of his mystical body. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. We speak of the Trinity as not being like this static reality. It's these processions that are eternally happening, that the Father pours himself out of the Son, and the love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is spirated between the Father and the Son. The Father is called the unsourced source. There's no beginning or end to this, but there's this dynamic activities. We call these processions. And Jesus is saying, you know, as I, as the living Father, so it's the living Father, the Father is the source of life, sent me, and I live because of the Father. The Father gives me his life. So he who eats me will live because of me. So he receives that life, and then he comes down to the incarnation and gives us that life. Not more of this life, not a seminar to teach us how to be more productive or to get more done or to be more organized or to be more efficient. That's the world's life, the best the world can do. He's giving us supernatural life, divine life. He's giving us a life of charity, a life that we can have mercy and forgiveness towards others, and we can love one another. We can act on a, a, a divine plane. You know, we can, we can love with His love. You know, marriage is an, an image of this. You can have this permanent bond that's formed that, you know, for the entirety of our life, we commit to this person, to love this person in the marital bond. And that's made, par that's made possible by the sacraments, that's made possible by the gift of his life to us, and that's coming to us in the most extraordinary way in the Eucharist. The Word became flesh. He gives us that, his flesh to eat, and his blood to drink, to transform us. So he who eats me will live because of me. He who eats my bread will live forever. Things like eternal life, mutual abiding presence, you know, and this life of the Father is given to us. You know, all this is happening in the Eucharist, the most extraordinary way. So yes, the Eucharist is the real presence. We keep it in the tabernacle and the lock and key. We honor his presence in Eucharistic processions. And that's powerful to do because that's such a, a teaching element that, hey, we adore Jesus present in the Eucharist. You know, the whole parish and even the people that see Eucharistic adoration, a procession, are reminded of this, right? People kneel when the procession happens, if they're able to. It's such a powerful teaching element that it can, it can revive all of our faiths. I mean, we need to rekindle, as John Paul II said, that Eucharistic amazement. You know, these processions, spending time in adoration, you know, going to adoration chapels, you know, cultivates that real Eucharistic faith because the Catholic faith is a Eucharistic faith. It's centered around Jesus Christ and his presence in the Eucharist. 
every mass that's renewed in us, that faith, sanctifying grace is given to us, increases in us. So yes, we need a revival. <laughs> yes, it's important. We all need to, to protect this faith that we have because Satan wants to tear it apart. What happens in John 6? You know, it's prophesied that, that Judas will betray him. And the crowds leave him that day. Many disciples left him that day. And at the end of John 6, we're told he turns to the apostles. He, he loses a big crowd in this teaching. He could have easily softened this and made us metaphor out of it and not challenging us and probably got all these people back. He lost many disciples that day. He turns to the 12, the foundation stones of the church that he's been with and he's forming, and he's ready to lose them. Do you also want to leave? And Peter says, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. I used to think that was kind of a, doesn't seem like the, the strongest endorsement. You know, if there's a better gig, I'd go to it, right? <laughs> where else can we go for eternal life? I can't get that from the world. I can't get that for myself. Even if Father Mark is firing on all cylinders, which he never does, <laughs> I can't get eternal life. That comes from God himself. Peter's saying, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Holy One of God. It comes from him alone. So this precious gift is given to us in the Eucharist. We confess our sins. We go to Mass. We pray the rosary. We have our own personal piety leading up to Mass, so our faith is strong. And if you have fallen, if you have drifted away, go to confession. That grace is given back to you. Go to adoration. That grace is given back to you. you know, God will replant what the locusts have, have eaten. You know, it's never too late to turn back. It's his work in our life. Well, this is a quote from the admonitions of St. Francis, these admonitions he gave to his brothers. So therefore, O sons of men, how long will you be hard of heart? Why do you not recognize the truth and believe in the Son of God? See, daily he humbles himself, as when he came from the royal throne into the womb of the Virgin. Daily he comes to us in a humble form. Daily he comes down from the bosom of the Father, upon the altar in the hands of the priest. And as he appeared to the holy apostles in true flesh, so now he reveals himself to us in the sacred bread. And as they only saw his flesh by means of their bodily sight, yet believed him to be God as they contemplated him with the eyes of faith, so as we see bread and wine with our bodily eyes, we too are to see and firmly believe them to be his most holy body and blood, living and true. And in this way the Lord is always with his faithful, as he himself says, Behold, I am with you, even to the end of the world. So we see the humility of Christ, you know, becoming flesh, becoming man. And that, that logic of that incarnation, that humility is continued in the Eucharist. He comes to us under the most simple outward signs of bread and wine, something very common. And yet he's truly there, his presence is there. It helps us... Um, you know, to have humility ourselves, you know, to not to be afraid to approach him. Right? We celebrate Christmas, he comes as, a, as an infant, right? What's more non-threatening than an infant? What's more non-threatening than, you know, under the Eucharist to us? And the sacraments have a way of humbling us. You know, we submit to baptism. We have waters poured over our head. We confess our sins. That's a humbling thing. We come and kneel in adoration. That's a humbling thing to Hopefully we can imitate the humility of Christ in our Eucharistic devotion, in our sacramental practice of confession. And one of the titles of the Eucharist is it's, it's the bread of immortality. It's the medicine of immortality. It's a, it's a great source of hope for us that you know, by living a sacramental life, by practicing our faith, by living our religion, that you know, we can have this, this assurance of perseverance that He is working in us. Not assurance in myself and my own strength, but I'm receiving His life. So we shouldn't be afraid to come. I hear that all the time as a priest. You know, I, I could never go to church. You know, I'm not holy enough to go to church. 
And none of us are, you know, we have to repent of our sins. We have the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation. We can repent of sins. But, you know, if we have that humility to come and let God work in us, we can have this wonderful peace, this, this bread of immortality, that I can have this assurance that God's work in me will see me through. That's the big thing, I think. You know, we tell, we're told in the scriptures in Isaiah that, you know, fear not, O Israel, I have redeemed you. You are mine. I call you by name. It's a beautiful, we just read that on the, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You are mine. You are mine. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. And the Eucharist is reaching down into our life for receiving him, and he's taking possession of us. He's giving us strength to get to heaven, to bring us to heaven, joined to him as he ascended to heaven. And we, united to him in the mystical body, we're brought to heaven. I need some kind of assurance, I need some kind of strength that's not my own to do that. And the church as a mother is feeding us this. Our Lady is helping us to persevere. The sacraments are helping us to persevere. So yes, we have hope in a broken, sinful world. We live in a broken, sinful humanity. We have hope because we're receiving this bread of life. I'm repenting of sin and God's working in me. You know, we have that faith and humility and come to him in the Eucharist. That's our source of strength. Now God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.